All right, welcome back to another video about International Baccalaureate's Environmental Systems and Societies course. This video is about topic 6.3, photochemical smog. The first big idea in topic 6.3 is that fossil fuels produce primary pollutants and that those primary pollutants, the first pollutants produced, create secondary pollutants and that those secondary pollutants are the things that actually create smog. For ESS, you really should know what your primary pollutants are. And the main ones you need to be aware of are sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen. If you'll notice here, there's a little X next to the O. That's because nitrogen and oxygen can combine in several different forms. Sometimes it's nitrogen monoxide, sometimes it's nitrogen dioxide, it might be dinitrogen, dinitrogen trioxide. All you, need, all you need to do is call them oxides of nitrogen, right? Your sulfur dioxides come predominantly from the production of electricity at power plants through the burning of coal, because a lot of coal has sulfur in it, if you'll see. Only about 5% of it comes from vehicular traffic. You don't need to know those, know these percentages. You just need to know that the primary source or the main source of sulfur dioxide as a primary pollutant is the burning of coal to produce electricity. On the other hand, these different oxides of nitrogen come predominantly from vehicular traffic. Right? Some of it comes from burning coal but most of it comes from cars and trucks on the road, all right? Your primary pollutants, the sulfur dioxide and the oxides of nitrogen, right, themselves are not what causes the smog, right? What causes the smog is when those primary pollutants, the oxides of nitrogen and sulfur, they undergo chemical reactions in the atmosphere, which then produces ozone in the troposphere, that's ground level ozone. And that, that ground level ozone is the main component of photochemical smog. Here's a little animated chemical reaction to show you how it works, right? Your primary pollutants here, right? Interact with hydroxides in the atmosphere and the nitrogen oxides and because of that, what they do is they actually release individual oxygen atoms that bond with free diatomic oxygen in the atmosphere to create ozone. And the ozone that is in the troposphere at ground level, that's the bad ozone. Remember, ozone is ozone. It's still O3. Ozone in the stratosphere, where we have the ozone layer, is good ozone because it filters out that ultraviolet radiation. Whereas ozone in the troposphere down here at the surface of the planet is a bad ozone because of the way it reacts with living organisms and different materials. Okay, let's take a look at some of those impacts. Right? The big idea, of course, is that smog has significant impacts on people and living systems. This is, after all, an environmental systems and societies class, right? So we've been able to study the economic impacts of photochemical smog, right, in California back in, I don't know, about 10 years ago or so, they estimated at about a half a billion US dollars annually in healthcare costs associated with smog, right? Why smog is harmful, it burns your eyes. It's like constantly living in a cloud of cigarette smoke, right? It aggravates the alveoli and the lungs, it stresses out your lungs, produces shortness of breath, which makes your body work harder, which can lead to um, wear and tear on your cardiovascular system over time, leading to an increase in heart attacks, right? There's a lot of health effects. So those are human health effects that you should know. There are also direct health, direct impacts on other organisms, particularly producers, right? You can see this little brown area or damaged area of this leaf. This is ozone damage because ozone 
interacts with the outer layers of these plants. And wherever you see this brown, this plant is no longer able to photosynthesize. So it's producing less biomass or energy to feed into the ecosystem. And these brown areas are also areas of weakness and they allow different disease pathogens to enter the plant and can make the plant sick or susceptible to disease over time. Right? So again, impacts of ozone irritates eyes, causes respiratory illnesses, right? You should know that it is a complex mixture of several different pollutants. You should always refer to ground level ozone as tropospheric ozone, or you can call it ground level ozone. You just need to be able to distinguish it, make it clear when you're writing on your ESS exam that you distinguish ozone at the ground from ozone in the stratosphere where the ozone layer is. In ESS, you don't need to know the complexities of these chemical reactions. What you need to know is that your oxides of nitrogen and your oxides of sulfur undergo a series of chemical reactions in the atmosphere to produce ground level ozone. And that that is the primary um, ingredient to smog in cities, right? Here you've got Warsaw, Poland. This is Delhi and in India. And frankly, this picture is not as bad as it frequently is. This is what Los Angeles always looked like when I was a kid growing up in the United States. And this is Santiago, Chile. And I want you to look at this picture carefully. Right here in the middle, you have this dense layer of really thick, nasty, brown photochemical smog. This is what it looks like. And I want you to look at the topography here, the shape of the land. You've got all these mountains in the background, right? Those mountains play a critical role in Santiago's smog problem because those mountains are really what causes something called a thermal inversion. Right? And a thermal inversion, an inversion means something is backwards or it's been flipped. So typically, right, warm air rises through the atmosphere and that it, it's replaced by cooler air. You get horizontal winds that come in from the side to replace that warm air as it rises. What happens with a thermal inversion is that because you have mountains um, on either side of a city or maybe a city is in a, in a valley where it's surrounded by higher landscape around, around it, right? as that warm air rises, particularly if a cold front has moved in, that cold air is, is denser. And so it sinks down and it presses down on that rising warm air. And because of the shape of the land, that warm air can't escape. So it essentially sits on top of the city and acts like a cap. And it traps all of that smog in a layer underneath it. That's where you get this image right here. So this is colder mountain air up here. This is where all the warm air is that is rising out of the city off of the thermal mass of the concrete that's in the asphalt that's in a city, right? And it can't go anywhere generally until some kind of a storm comes in and blows, kind of disrupts the, those layers of air and clean, clears the air, right? You'll also get smog from things that are happening outside of cities. Um, in several different places where I've lived, including here in Cambodia, you've got farmers who will burn the land in preparation for planting. And all of that smoke, that particulate matter will drift into the cities and can contribute to smog. Right? And smog not only has significant impacts on human health and the health of other organisms, it also has really significant economic costs. So this is a percentage of GDP. So here we are in East Asia and the Pacific, we're at seven and a half percent of the total GDP equivalent is lost due to urban air pollution, right? In South Asia, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, very similar, seven and a half percent almost, right? Middle East, North Africa is significantly lower. Latin America and Caribbean also significantly lower. These are smaller land masses. Islands have good horizontal air movement because of their proximity to the oceans, right? Economic losses, 
here we go, three crops, wheat, rice, and maize in three different countries, China, Japan, and South Korea. Just in those three countries, ground level ozone causes about $63 billion in crop losses every year, right? Those are direct crop losses from those crops being impacted by the ozone in the air. Right? Remember back in topic one, I think it was 1.5 humans in pollution. We introduced the three tiers of pollution management strategies. You're going to need to apply it to photochemical smog, right? So let's take a look at a bunch of pollution management strategies for smog, right? Here you go. Consume fewer fossil fuels. That means change human behavior, adopt different means of transportation, public transport, public transit, like these trains or buses, or, Hey, you could walk or you can cycle because these don't release carbon dioxide. Tier two, you can regulate and reduce the amount of pollutants into the atmosphere. This is where carbon pricing or the cap and trade mechanisms come into play. This is a very, very rapidly expanding global business, right? Governments are involved in buying and selling these carbon credits. They've been structured so that innovative businesses can reduce their emissions and sell the excess emissions to recoup some of the costs that they invested in that research and development, right? Catalytic converters. These are devices that go into the exhaust system of vehicles and they have a, this fine mesh of heavy metals in them that actually will trap a lot of the primary pollutants. And so it reduces the amount of the primary pollutants entering the atmosphere. It doesn't eliminate it. So it's not tier one, but it reduces it. So it's tier two. Right. We can regulate the fuel quality, right? So we're looking at um, the carbon content of different fuel sources, right? And use those to generate more or less electricity or to fuel um, vehicles. If we have specialized vehicles that run on like ethanol, something like that, right? And then tier three, which is just cleaning up, right? Is not necessarily inventing something that will extract the pollutants directly from the atmosphere, right? What we can do is we can sequester carbon dioxide. And one of the easiest ways to do that is simply to plant trees, right? Because those trees will, through the process of photosynthesis, take CO2 out of the atmosphere and build it into glucose that they then incorporate into the biomass of the tree. So that that carbon stops being a greenhouse gas and becomes biomass in a form of energy for the ecosystem, right? Currently, there are a lot of um, startup businesses that are trying to do carbon sequestration mechanically from the atmosphere, and they're able to do it. But so far, nobody's been able to figure out how to actually turn a profit through that process, right? So to recap, three tiers of pollution management strategies for photochemical smog, change your human behaviors, walk or cycle to work, use public transportation, increase the energy efficiency. Tier two, capture or regulate the emissions, cap and trade, tax the pollutions, install catalytic converters, install scrubbers on industrial smokestacks, regulate the quality of the fuels. And in tier three, as you clean up the environment, predominantly through reforestation activities or potentially kind of a technocentric approach of carbon sequestration through an industrial process. Right. That's it for topic 6.3, photochemical smog. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. If you'd like more resources for IB Environmental Systems and Societies, check out my website, mrcremerscience.com. Or you can also follow me on Twitter or X at Bradley M. Creamer. Thank you so much.